Victor Davis Hanson, Senior Fellow in Military History at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, Professor Emeritus in the Classics at Cal State University. Victor, welcome back. It's great to see you again. Good to see you, you. I like to tell people I was reading Victor Davis Hanson before George W. Bush was 20 years ago, and he's been a guest on my show for 21 years. His new book, The Dying Citizen, if people were listening to the show just now, was just endorsed by Tom Cotton, who has read the whole thing. I've read the introduction, the conclusion, and chapter four on tribes. I have not had enough time to read the entire thing, Victor, but there's lots to read here. The Dying Citizen is not happy talk, is it? No, it's not, unfortunately. It's, uh, it was written right before the, these catastrophic series of events in two, that terrible year of 2020, and I finished it in the middle of it, and then I wrote an afterword at the end of the year. Yeah, so it was... I read the epilogue, was, and I read with particular uh, uh, gusto the conclusion of the epilogue, which I want people to hear now, because you don't conclude with despair. Despair is a sin, and you don't indulge it. You conclude with resilience. As 2021 began, the supporters of restoring the primacy of American citizen were not so confident in their own powers of renovation as they were convinced that they had no other choice but to keep trying. The stakes were no less than the preservation of the American Republic itself. I don't believe that's overstatement, Victor Davis Hanson. Why did you choose to close on that note? Well, I, I'm optimistic, you, for all of Trump's foibles, uh, by 2020, say January, if you and I were having this discussion, we would say the border is get finally closed. It's legal, meritocratic, diverse, and limited immigration. And we would say that abroad, we have restored deterrence without a need for optional military major engagements. And we would say that uh, for the first time in 12 years, the middle class actually had an increase in real income. And we would say that we finally address asymmetries in the post-global trading and commercial order. And I would say that people had, for the first time in my life, addressed this administrative state, this judge, jury, executioner, huge bureaucracy. And we weren't talking about ending the electoral college or packing the court or getting rid of the filibuster. And this was the first time in my life we also questioned the International Criminal Court seriously or the UN uh, lecturing us on racism or Israel's illiberality. So there was a sense that America wasn't just rhetorically exceptional, but w we were, we had more faith in us and our medical system, to take one example, than the WHO. And that seems to have been lost that terrible year, 2020. I, I agree with that assessment. I also believe it was the first year prior to 2020 when we had begun to confront the People's Republic of China's Chinese Communist Party. Now, that might be the one happy result of the virus is that we understand them to be a lethal agent on the world stage, not that we've acted on it. But I want to begin in the middle and then go to the beginning. Uh, I told you I read Tribes because I'm particularly interested in one aspect of the dying citizen, which is the politicization of retired generals. I happen to know General Mattis, as do you. I know General McChrystal. I know uh, over the radio uh, the former head of the SEALs, General McRaven, uh, Admiral McRaven. I know a lot of these people, and I admire them greatly, as I know you do, General Mattis. But you comment on their almost uniform critique of President Trump, and that goes to Barry McCaffrey as well, who I follow on Twitter, and he follows me, and many other generals. I have a theory, Victor, why this has happened. I want to test it out on you. The generals and the admirals, general officers, come up through decades where fit reps are part of their promotion, fitness reps. Uh, they, they, are, they are graded continually, usually once a year at a minimum, sometimes twice a year. So they have to be uh, fit for their next promotion and their uh, achievement. I believe most of these generals and admirals did not believe that President Trump was aesthetically or temperamentally fit for the office despite his policy preferences, and that they were incapable of understanding that the essential American right is to choose people without regard to resume, and they reject that. What do you think of my assessment of why there is this aesthetic distaste for the former president among the general officers? I think it's a tangent to what I wrote in the book and what I do believe, and I think it's similar in some ways to you. I think to get promoted in today's politically correct environment or landscape, you don't get promoted for how many shells hit the target or how many pilots landed on the first try on a carrier, but 
uh, race and um, gender issues more, and more importantly, that Washington nexus now, where people at lieutenant colonel and colonel and one star get posted, acculturates that officer corps to the, the following you, that they know that the right and the conservatives will always back the military, or so they think, but the left won't. And so they reach out and they really say to the left, we can fast track uh, transgender soldiers or gay marriage or women in combat units or pregnancy suits in a way that gets rid of the legislative mess of give and take because of our chain of command. And the left now has actually welcomed these generals. And then a final twist to that is when they go out, and remember they have been going in and out to Raytheon, General Dynamics, Lockheed, Northrop, then those corporations also have a similar culture. And if they were going to be outspoken on just, it doesn't have to be politically outspoken, but just one-dimensionally military and not social uh, justice voices and megaphones, I think that their post-retirement careers would be in danger. That is very well uh, articulated. I, I just, uh, I go on my tangent. I believe, because I know one of them very well who told me personally that it was a character issue with him before Trump ran, that it simply could not accept the character defects in the president as acceptable in the commander in chief, that yeah. they would not I, be accepted I, I don't in the general officer. The reason I, I gather. Because I gather. there's, Let, there's uh, the uniform code of military justice, Article 88, says that no top ranking officer, retired or acting, can disparage, quote unquote, the commander in chief. So if they're really interested in character issues, and General McCaffrey would not call the president a Mussolini-like character. I won't mention some that of the That is, by the way, you're correct. The, yeah. the uh, appeal to the military code of justice, I have no argument with. You are right. Yeah. And when General Mattis left, he did the right thing by not criticizing Trump after he left the Secretary of Defense because he was still in the chain of command. Victor, I want to ask you about something I also came up with before we go back to the key parts of the dying citizen. It occurs that today when we're talking, 22 of the 25 ranked colleges in national football by the AP are in red states, Alabama, Georgia, Ohio State. And in some of those 25 that are in purple states, like Penn State, are in the red part of the purple state. Only Oregon and San Diego State are in blue states. Do you have a theory, I do, as to why college football succeeds in red states far beyond the way it succeeds in blue states today? Well, I think it represents this. It, it doesn't, and it's unlike pro football, which has become performance woke art. I think a lot of people in these places uh, incorporate going out to a Saturday football game as in the same sense as Fourth of July or standing for the national anthem or singing God Bless America. It's a festive public ritual for red state America. And in a way that pro sports used to be, but now the NBA or the NFL, even Major League Baseball has forfeited that. It's become a Hollywood-centric or celebrity-centric or New York-centric sport. So I think they're, they're, and actually, their popularity is increasing as a result that people innately like sports, but they're shifting from pro sports, I think, to what you talk about. Well, I also want to add to your assessment. When you think about this, the red states are least amenable to woke college politics. The faculties at red state land great universities are much less likely to be woke, though they will be woke. And the administrator is much more dependent upon red state voters and red state tax acceptance and red state support for public universities than our blue states. What do you think of my, my theory, Victor? Well, I think in large part it's, it's true outside of particular states like California. I taught for 21 years at the CSU system, which you know well, you, and you know that it's woke. Yep. But you're generally correct because especially the Board of Regents and the overseers, they, they come from business, they come from all walks of life, and they just don't put up with it. And they have some pressure on the college presidents. So you're, you're, you're right about that. Otherwise, no, I they're, in go. Tall, they're in the tall. Most of the higher education, as you know, is woke. Oh, it's, it's terrible. I've, I'm off for a year from teaching, but it's getting worse and worse every year. Victor, I want to turn to uh, the question of Straussianism. I had Harvey Mansfield on last week, and I have also been talking with Glenn Elmers about his book, The Soul of Politics. And as I read The Dying Citizen, I slowed down rather than accelerated because I began to think, I think Victor is a Straussian in that there might be two ways to read this book, uh, a surface reading, an appeal to citizenship, 
and then a deeper critique of what is really going on. Am I right? Yeah, I think so. I, uh, I know Leo Strauss, when I started reading his, he, he translated Xenophon's Oikonomica. So he was a top, top rate classicist and his daughter, Jenny Strauss was very well known in our field. So I, I knew him in the context of a, a superb Greek scholar. And I read most of his work in that context, but I think he was talking about the classical formula of affluence and leisure and comfortability and the therapeutic view is sort of leading to, on a trajectory where we are now, where you're rel relative and not absolute. And in contrast to the tragic view that's so common that we don't have good choices. We, we have 51% choices and we live with the consequences rather than human nature is changing all the time. It's malleable, it's fluid. And we can we can get out of all these jams that are, you know, they're just temporary. They're not part of the age-old quest of man and the environment. And so I, I think in that sense, I was trying to suggest that there's a therapeutic view that's behind this dying citizen rather than the old tragic view that, of the ancient world. There is also... The only, th the only thing I have a, an objection to is, and I think he's been mischaracterized, that it goes back to Plato's noble lie. And we've seen some of that, that with the... Uh, Dr. Fauci, again and again and again, whether it's not telling us the truth, and you had him on your show and it was quite a good interview, but I think what, and I think you were right about that because what you were really saying to him was, if you say one mask, two mask, no mask, one mask, two mask, herd immunity 50, 60, 70, 80, and you're that uh, malleable to use that word again, but more importantly, you say you really don't know whether natural immunity has superior uh, protective or prophylactic ability than vaccinations, and he, we know that it does, then he's nobly lying because he feels that he has to deceive the less informed public in a way Plato discussed, because otherwise they might not get back, so they might do something that he wouldn't approve of. So it gives him a license to say, I can say whatever I want because I'm doing it for the public good. Whenever you go down that route, you, you, you end up in bad, Bad territory. The most satisfactory thing that I have read in years is your, you would not be wrong to think, my gosh, Hugh Hewitt just did an interview with Dr. Fauci of the sort I described in The Dying Citizen, uh, asking him about the credibility lab. I had not read that yet, but you and I have the same concerns over the administrative state, the unappointed, unelected bureaucrat who is tenured making decisions for the country and a lack of credibility. No, I like Dr. Fauci. I think he's a scientist. He's a little bit in love with his own opinion. But um, I did ask the questions that you posed in The Dying Citizen. I was very gratified to see you would have structured the interview the same way. I, though, when I brought up Strauss, was referring to Strauss's belief that philosophers and public intellectuals, to a lesser degree there, is a Venn diagram there, have to write very carefully for fear of being canceled. In the case of Socrates, the ultimate cancellation. And I thought you wrote very carefully in The Dying Citizen when you began by talking about the Greek king who frees the Spartan slaves and holding him up as an admirable character, the Thessalonian king, and then talking about the, the ad admirable qualities of the Sparta city-state constitution. So I was wondering, which is it? Do we admire their constitution or do we admire the king who destroyed that constitution? Well, I, it, it's the same. It's the same dilemma that we have uh, with Robert E. Lee, and that is Robert E. Lee was on the wrong side of the Civil War. He was amoral, and he did a lot of damage. But personally, his character—he was not like uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, let's say, the founder of the Ku Klux Klan. He was a better man than many of the of, this, of the Southern generals. He was a tragic figure because he was talented and he put those talents to the wrong cause. Sparta had a system that was stable. It's, it's the foundation of, of what we call checks and balances. It was the first government in the world to have a legislative, judicial, and executive branch. It was much more stable than the radical democracies. And the radical democracies had more chattel slaves than did Sparta, but Sparta had something more insidious, serfdom, half-citizens quarter system that was much harder to to deal with in the ancient mind. So when Epaminondas and the Thebans liberated them, we all, I think, 
the ancient world, not my view, felt that he was the greatest man that Greece and Rome produced. Now, we always say Caesar was or Alexander the Great or Socrates, whatever our preference in military or intellectual matters. But the ancients, if you read what Cicero wrote or later people um, at the time, uh, the rhetoricians in Athens, they felt he was the greatest man because he liberated an entire population who should have been free because they were not chattel slaves. They were citizens that had been demoted regionally to an entire form of, subser of subservience. And what I'm getting at, I what? guess, is that you can, you can be, that, that's what's hard is to see good men like the Spartans. I mean, these are the same men that stopped the Persians at Thermopylae and saved Greek democracy, even though they weren't a participant in Athenian democracy, do bad things and have a system that was not, we wouldn't, given the morality of the time, the ancients thought was bad. But people, I, I think that's just too complicated for the society to say that there were good people in the South who did a lot of damage, and they didn't think they were doing damage. They didn't own slaves. They didn't approve of slaves. Lee did have slaves. But the Longstreet was a good general, another example. But we just don't say that they're evil people. They're tragic people rather than evil, I think. Rommel's we can explain that in the Coopers. Yeah, Lincoln explained that in the Cooper's Union speech where he pointed out that all of the framers, everyone who signed the Declaration, had a moral understanding of slavery as bad. They were flummoxed as to how to end it. Calhoun changed that. Calhoun is, is the evil man in American history because of his theory of the yeah. primacy, the eugenics theory, uh, which he really introduces and then the progressives grab onto. Victor, I want to talk to you about what you outlined as the dual threat to citizenship. It's really the dual threat to the middle class, to the every suburban man that you chart out, most accessible to the audience, perhaps in the form of Red in that 70s show or the dad in the Wonder Years or the dad in Leave it to Beaver. The every man in suburbia is the basis on which uh, suburban middle class life built a solid foundation for America in the Cold War that got us through the Reagan victory over the, the Soviet Union. That's dying because of pressure from the top unelected elites in a permanent government. Some call it the deep state. I don't. I call it the permanent government, the SES, and pressure from below that residents be considered citizens in all ways, which is the more insidious. I think I've explained your theory, the pressure yeah. on citizenship, but which is the more insidious threat? Well, I think the pressure from the top because they have more power, influence, and control because we're talking about a small group, a minority that control Hollywood entertainment, the media, Silicon Valley, uh, professional sports, K through 12 academia foundations. And so that is a 360 degree echo all day long. And they do not like the middle class. They feel the middle class lacks the taste of the wealthy and it doesn't have the romance of the distant, distant poor. They don't like to be with the poor, but there, this is the deplorables or the irredeemables or what uh, Obama called the clingers or what Biden has called, you know, fat or lying dog faced pony soldier or chumps or dregs, the kind of people who buy jet skis or borrow money to buy a Winnebago and they don't like these people. But I was trying to, um, to say they were the logical extension of the classical agrarian with 10 acres that was autonomous. The idea if they're autonomous and they don't need government and they're not envious of the rich, then all of the classical virtues are still with us and they are to be blunt you they feel a natural distrust to the rich they feel they try to use their their wealth and to leverage government in a way that serves their narrow inner interest so they look at the poor and they say they're either dependent on the government or they're obsequious to the rich but they're not in a position to be independent and so when you lose this middle class you're losing the participatory citizen that is a watchdog on the poor and the rich you, know, you made you put me in the mind of the dying citizen of the single most important op-ed that I have read, uh, not written by Victor Davis Hanson, in the last 10 years. It was by Peggy Noonan before the 2016 election, where she talked about the unprotected versus the protected. And the unprotected represent those people who are neither dependent upon the government nor envious of the rich. They are autonomous and free, and they are happy in their freedom. The protected are often protected by the government. And that invests them in the government, especially those who run the government. I retreat to, to Dr. Fauci and the permanent SES class of about 4,000 individuals who run the government. They are 
growing ever more distant, Dr. Uh, Hansen, from people who live outside of the Beltway. This is the problem. They really don't have any connection. I'm inside the Beltway. You're far away from it. Do you put your finger on that as the biggest source of the disconnect between the governing elite and the average middle class citizen? I do. Uh, I think also it's not just their compensation is above what people in commiserate jobs in the private sector make, but they have this whole bundle. When you talk to certain people about their health care, they're saying, I'm paying $5,000, 8000 10000 a year, but I have a 5000 deductible. But when you look at these government plans or you look at the benefits or the salaries, they have a cocoon around them. They protect their own. And more importantly, most of these are not muscular jobs. And by that, I mean they're not associating with the independent truck driver or the guy that runs a 7-Eleven or the guy that has 150 acres of oranges. So they don't have, they don't, they're not frequently in contact with people who said, I don't know where my check, I missed that load, I didn't get any money, or I had a freeze this March, I lost my crop, or somebody broke into my 7-Eleven and did, so they're, they're insulated from what most Americans feel. And then because of that insulation, so often we have these very wealthy people in and out of government that I think psychologically they don't want to be with the middle class or even the poor, and they create this facade of virtue signaling. We use this word virtue signaling. It's a good word. I don't use it too often, but it's a good word because it suggests that they're guilty, that they're immune from the ramifications of their own ideology. And therefore, how do they square that circle? They say, well, I want everybody to come into the border. And yet if you say to people where I work at Sanford University, okay, you've got 4,000 dorm rooms. It's summertime. Nobody is here. You have a law school for legal aid. You have a medical school for the best medical care. You have summer school students that could tutor. Why not take people from the border and we'll put 2,000 illegal aliens into the Stanford dorms for three months? And you, you could see people get furious. I've written a column and they almost... I've had people come up yeah. on campus and say, you should, you're horrible. How dare you? And this is from very left-wing people. So, you know, I don't feel that that class really wants to be around the middle class or even the poor that it romanticizes. And that's a lot of what's been going on with social media and such. I, I can say this without uh, fear of contradiction. My three children went through 36 years of public education. And so I am a public education advocate. And I believe that you will find most elite private schools, I believe you write about this in a chapter I haven't come to yet, educating the children of the elite left. I believe that is the case across the United States at places yes. like the elite public schools of Stanford's area, of LA, of Washington, and of New York, the four epicenters of elite dominance of America. Now, Victor, where I am an optimist, and perhaps you are not, is I believe blowback is coming. President Trump may be an accelerant of it in 2016 and an impediment to it in 2024, but I believe blowback is coming because people value their freedom in a much greater way. I go back to my AP Top 25. The other reason those colleges succeed is they, they accept the idea of the masculine coach, the male coach. What Harvey Mansfield wrote is the essential virtue necessary to be manly. It's not limited to men, by the way. Virtu can be in women as well, as you well know. But that the red states are very comfortable with this idea of masculinity and that the blue states are not and that the woke corporations are not, but that most of America is. I don't think, I think it was Lincoln who said, if you drive nature out the front door, it will come in the back door. Do you agree with Lincoln on that? Yeah, I think there's innate. It's imprinted to us at birth that we have a natural innate desire for certain people to combine physical courage and intellectual courage and spiritual courage and to do things for other people that's going to impair or harm them. And they don't, you're right about they don't have to be male. I'm thinking of great figures out of Greek tragedy like Antigone, who does things that males won't do. But it's the same idea that certain people are willing to put their lives on the line and they live by a particular code. It's the John Ford Western. Shane also is a good model, and Sophocles' tra tragic figures. And I think people are dying, and they're 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 yearning for that. I, I do believe, though, I would agree with you. I, I think we're going to have the first manifestation in the midterms. I think we're going to see a 2010 or a 2094, maybe even a 2038 
1938, excuse me, correction of the incumbent in the House elections, especially. I think they'll take back the Senate, and then I think uh, we'll have an executive order presidency that's very uh, anemic and weakened. And then, the, then the, the problem everybody's going to have is, while they're supporters of the MAGA agenda, do they feel Donald Trump is at, you know, 78, 77, is going to be the proper emissary? A lot of people feel that, and I, you know, I've been very complimentary on him, but it's a, there's have, we have to distinguish between getting mad at and having the ability to get even with, and those are not necessarily the same ability. 100%. The effectiveness of Donald Trump in the first term is simply not up for debate. We are having the first week of the new Supreme Court term with six conservative justices Absolutely. on the court because of Donald Trump. You point out in The Dying Citizen that the left's march through elite institutions, and the three I remember are academia, the legal profession, and um, I can't remember the third. Uh, I'll just go with those two because they can. Oh, the government, the permanent government. Yes. Uh, the left's march through the legal profession is complete, Victor. I think you know that. The law schools yes. of America, if they have one out of 30 professors teaching con law who's an originalist, I'd be surprised. I really would be surprised. The Federalist Society has replaced academia in teaching originalism in the way that I do. Uh, I also believe that the SES, if you ask them how they vote, it would be 95% to zero. And if you find the people who appear on major network television and add in CNN and MSNBC, 95% will have voted against Trump, if not for Biden. Do you agree with my estimates? Oh, absolutely. And we could even include the professional celebrity sports circuit or the, founda the big foundations. I'm a member of the Bradley Foundation, and we pat our back on the board that we're a lot, one of the largest conservatives until I saw a presentation where, based on the endowment value, I think we're something like 80th among foundations that give money for cultural and social and political causes. And all of the, all of the other ones were left wing. So this, what, what's happened also, you, in our lifetime, whether we adjudicate it by zip codes or congressional districts or blue red, Money now, look at the Fortune 400. Money is a left-wing monopoly. The wealth in this country was created through globalization, bicoastal law, finance, Silicon Valley. But the great powers in this country, whether it's George Soros or Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos, all Bill Gates are on the left. And that's new. We've never really seen that, that the left is now very comfortable with what we what they used to call dark money or the accumulation of capital. And we really saw it in the 2000. 20 election when Mark Zuckerberg at the last moment infused $500 million in selected precincts to uh, em energize well, precinct Well, Victor, workers. That's, that's simply a function of self-interest. The unregulated Silicon Valley companies wish to remain unregulated because the unregulated economy is where they prosper, as every business, including railroads, be, and now they, they don't want to be regulated, so they've become... Yeah. Whatever they need to be. They're the most heavily represented lobbying group in the United States now, the big tech, the fang stocks. Let me ask you how, you know, the, the peril of the dying citizen, the ominous tone of the dying citizen, is your evident belief we're at the, uh, at the edge of the abyss. If Sparta only lasted 600 years and the United States is at 250, how long can this last? And Aristotle's cycle of politics is the Aristotle's cycle of politics, and it hasn't changed since he wrote the politics. Are you an optimist about this coming back, or am I foolish to think another Reagan is on the way? No, I, I have to remain an optimist, and, and I sit, try to look at optimistic things in the book. One of the things I, even with the distortion and the attack on integration and assimilation and intermarriage of immigrants, where I live in the San Joaquin Valley, I think about the polls show 43% of people who identified as Latino voters and 50% of Latino males voted to recall. So when I look for common sense about issues in Selma, California, about the high price of electricity, why are we paying nearly $5 for gas? Why do we not have any reservoirs built? Why uh, do these people who make their laws live in 70 degree weather and we live in 105 and yet we have to pay all this for air conditioning? It, it comes from second generation and especially third generation Mexican American citizens. So I think that there's, uh, if we were to control the border and have legal immigration, meritocratic, limited, 
and uh, let, uh, we could assimilate people. I, it would be a great it would be a great boon. I think the Democratic Party is on the verge of a revolutionary disaster because I think they have offended a lot of the minorities on issues that Carl Wolf always told us this. I didn't believe him because of the sheer numbers. He said that we're importing people, importing people who were innately conservative, Catholic, and I didn't believe it because I saw them vote year after year for federal subsidies and open borders. But I think the left has gone so far that in their mind, they're, they're worried about a Venezuelan type of model that is atheistic, statist, and attacks people who have aspirations for upward mobility. So I'm, I'm very optimistic about that. I'm also optimistic in the sense that this red state model that you referenced is working so well that people that I know are going to Tennessee who are left wing and they're going to Texas and they're going to Idaho and that disconnect is very hard for them to square and everybody says well they're going to go over there and ruin those states but I don't think they are I think that state has had more influence on them than they have on that state Texas is not they keep saying Texas is going to turn blue I don't think so I think the Hispanic think so population either. is getting redder and so I'm I think what we're seeing, rather than a civil war, what we're seeing is something like the third century in Rome when it was gradually shifting to a Western, open, religiously disconnected, chaotic, exciting place. And then the Eastern part, the Byz Byzantium that said, you know what, we're under assault. We're gonna have a, a national religion. We're gonna, have, we're gonna go back to the old code of Rome. And then it lasted for a thousand years and the West uh, fragmented, but, and I think red states, and we have a bad name for Byzantines. We think they're bureaucratic and they're rigid, but I don't think if we look at history, they were. What they said was the West has forgotten unity and tradition and protocol and what made this Romanity work, and we're going to emphasize and double down, and it worked, and they gave civilization another millennium, whereas the West was just too, everybody was on their own agenda. They're, they couldn't deal with people that they had colonized, uh, the Gauls, the German, tried to do the Germans. So I think we're coming into a Byzantine America in the red states that is kind of, this system works, we're, gonna, we're not gonna tolerate, we're not gonna tolerate critical race theory in our schools, we're gonna double down, we'd have no apology for Lincoln or Jefferson versus this bi-coastal blue that's, everything goes, and, and it's not gonna be sustainable. So I see a breakdown in blue state America. And I really do. And that should, if, if the Constitution is honored, that should result in the ultimate check, which is the Senate. But the Constitution yeah. is in great danger from court packing. Court packing is actually the repeal of the Constitution because it will be done with the, with the specific intent of ruling by the bench by edict unrelated to the Constitution. So it's the and, greatest and, threat to the United States right. since the Civil War. And, and I actually think it's unconstitutional. It's an attempt to repeal the Constitution quite explicitly by putting into place judges who will not pay attention to the Constitution. But we well, haven't come to that bridge yet. Well, we have a the problem I see you is uh, where that the, the Supreme Court, for example, its membership is not in the Constitution. So we've had 150 years of stability with nine justices. But right now we're Kamala Harris's vote away or mansions or Sinema, one of these three people were just one vote away or two votes away from getting rid of it. And that used to be a dirty word, court packing, remember, because of there was 37 effort by Franklin Roosevelt. Now you see websites pack the court. And it's along with this, and I mentioned this in the book in the chapter on the evolutionaries, it's get away with the 60-year 50-state union to bring in four senators from the D.C. and Porter. It's to get away, get away from the 180-year filibuster. 233-year electoral college, 233-year constitutional directive that for most uh, national elections, the state have in, more uh, control over the balloting process than does the federal government. But all of those are under attack because they, they're they antithetical to voting any, on, any to doing what any, on any given day what 51% of the people want to do, even though they don't you have know, I, I think what you just described is the most maiorum of the United States. It's not actually written in the Constitution. Absolutely. They are the traditions which infuse the Constitution with texture and durability that were built up 
after the Civil War. So I always say I'm in favor of the Constitution as it was understood prior to 2016 with due regard to uh, stare decisis, but not obligatory stare decisis. I think they're going to overturn Roe v. Wade this year, and that will be just fine for the reasons articulated by the Chief Justice and his concurrence in, in Citizens United. Victor, I want to go to education because I think this is the electric point. And the, the dying citizen points out again about the march of the left through teachers' unions. In Virginia, the first evidence of a blowback to the Democratic agenda will come if Glenn Youngkin beats Terry McAuliffe in four weeks. If he does so, it's going to be because, uh, Terry McAuliffe said in the final debate in Virginia, I don't think parents should have control over the school boards. He actually said that, and Glenn Youngkin is playing in an endless loop in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And I have seen across the United States parents rise up against CRT, parents rise up against masking preschoolers and actually children in the elementary grades, parents now rising up against mandatory vaccines for their kids. Do you think the left's overreach on public education is going to be their undoing? It's going to be, I think it's going to be a, a major cause of their undoing because uh, they've given so many contrary messages. We, we all grew up and the lib, classical liberal idea was content of your character, not the color of your skin. Racism is bad. Discrimination is bad. And even on the sense of COVID, children have greater immunity to the disease, even in the Delta sense. They can get it, but they are more protected. And suddenly these uh, school boards are saying, discrimination is good. There's a good discrimination, almost like animal farm, you know, two legs bad, sometimes, sometimes good. So discrimination is good in ways that we adjudicate. Racism is good in ways that we adjudicate it. You're going to get masked. We don't want to hear the science about it. And I don't think that's going to be tenable. And a lot of people are, are and all of this discussion we've had, you, we, and I know you and I, I think we agree on this. We've assumed a, a zero sum, but it's, and we should articulate that, is that when we're doing this stuff, what are we not doing? When you're talking about contract law has been politicized, that means that the average law person who graduates from law school and you ask him the nuts and bolts of contract law to do, he's not very competent. And when I know in classics, one of the reasons that I stopped teaching was when I would interview these woke classicists, I would have to give them a page of Caesar or Xenophon. I'd say, translate. They couldn't translate because if you looked at their graduate transcript, they were taking the rhetoric of manhood or uh, the poetics of gender courses that didn't inculcate what these disciplines are about. And this is starting to infect our corporations. So when you have, if I call up Delta and I'm six hours on a consumer line, or I get on a flight from Fresno to Dallas and it goes in the wrong direction to San Francisco because we're out of fuel, and I hear the American Airlines president lecturing Texans on voting law, you get the impression that it's almost like a commissar system where so much time, labor, and capital is invested in ideological purity and policing that either these people don't have time to do their job or they can't do their job, and they're using this as some type of apology for their incompetence. And, and the locus classicus of that and was Afghanistan. So we've got all these people talking about kindy and wokeism and all of these extraneous issues when we have the greatest military debacle in the last 50 years right happening and we're they're unaware of it apparently there should so that, be a feminist a critique I, I don't know if you know ambassador Roz. she is the afghan ambassador to the united yeah, states and, abandoned yeah. by our state department and our pentagon completely cut off for more than 30 days from any communication with the pentagon or the state department because she represents the duly elected though corrupt government of afghanistan we left every woman in Afghanistan in the lurch. It's very hard to square the leftism of woke America with what we did to the women in Afghanistan, Victor Davis Hanson. Yeah. I believe that message gets through. I believe that that cuts through a biased media. And this is where I want to conclude. If The Dying Citizen becomes a bestseller, and I believe it will, most VDH books do, and I believe it will, it will not be because of the assistance of big media. So there is obviously a secondary communication system that is developed to override big media. How is that operating? I mean, almost every institution, I don't exempt the Hoover Institution from this, by the way. I think they have been subject to the influence of the left as well. I believe almost every university, every think tank 
the Nixon Seminar and the Hudson Institute are the last two uh, national security serious organizations left. AEI has unfortunately folded up since Arthur Brooks left. Heritage is a little bit enfeebled. They're all the same. They're all whoa. I, I agree with Major you. I agree with you. I, I agree with you. So Absolutely. where does where does word of well, it, it's what here here I'm not going to give. When I started writing the first ten or twelve or fifteen books, the New York Times book review or what the Washington Post said or what NPR and PBS said made a, a book. At least it gave it the chance to sink or swim. But now, not so much. You, uh, you've got, you've got talk radio. You've got podcast. You've got uh, blogs, and there's a whole nother communicative atmosphere out there. And so I think a lot of us feel we don't really care to talk to the New Yorker magazine anymore. We don't really want to be on NPR. It doesn't matter. It's in, we're indifferent to it because they're not. It they've lost half of them. It doesn't matter. It, it doesn't not, matter. And this, it brings me to the last point. I do believe that the Chick-fil-A syndrome, although Dan Cathay comes in for a hard part of the dying citizen, when Chick-fil-A was boycotted by the left, it was not covered that the right was going to go to Chick-fil-A and millions of Americans showed up at Chick-fil-A to buy their sandwiches the next week. Uh, that wasn't covered anywhere. There are vast amounts of American infrastructure communication-wise that now communicate with each other despite the blackout. The biggest danger to the organized left is that they are so insular, so deep inside the blue bubble that they do not hear the insurrection, and I do not mean January 6th, I mean the election insurrection brewing. Do you think they're that cut off, Victor, that they don't see it coming? They do, because they, they two reasons, they talk among themselves, and uh, they're haters. And so when somebody, you and I have members of our family, or we have friends that are on the right, uh, left, that's not the end of our, we don't just abort our relationships. For them, politics is a 24-7, they have a lidless eye, so to speak, and it, it's totalitarian and it's inclusive, and, and that way they don't, they don't get information they don't want, they don't see people they don't like, and that's all adjudicated by politics. And these institutions, you can see it, comedians, nobody's watching these late night comedians anymore because it's all been politicized. They have no idea that when they praise each other, wow, that was, he, he praised Obama better than she did that everybody looks at that and says, you know what, turn the channel. And that's happened. It's happened, especially in sports, but it's in entertainment. It's in news. I confess, I haven't watched the network news in 10 years. I have not watched it. No, I'm and with I you. I, don't, the, uh, I have to turn people on to Ted Lasso by word of mouth. Only the first season, the second season, saw a woke retraction of the first season, which was apparently yeah. too popular with Christians. Uh, very last question. This does not happen. The civilian, the citizen does not renew absent faith. Washington was the first to articulate this in a fairly comprehensive way for the citizenry to understand in his farewell address, though it was an assumption of the framers that religious liberty was, was deeply embedded. Do you see a necessary awakening? There have been periodic awakenings in American history. Do you see one as being necessary to the sort of rejuvenated citizenship that you aspire to in the dying citizen? I do. I think that you have to have a sense of transcendence and you have to understand there's some moral, natural, innate code that law is based on. And if you don't believe that, then everything is relative. And I think the left has been in control. And whether we look at sexual sexuality or whether we look at People uh, are all from nowhere. There's nobody lives somewhere, as people have pointed out. There's no roots. There's no permanence. There's no respect. There's no tolerance or, or honor for people in the past, the pre-industrial past, who suffered terribly without medicines and technology. And yet we, we judge them on the basis of the present. So we're, we're very ungracious people. So the anecdote for all that is humility. And humility starts with the idea that we're sort of all God's creatures, and we all are here for a very brief time. And we were supposed to reflect certain divine attributes. And to the degree that we do, there's going to be some world much better afterwards. I have always uh, Victor Davis, that. Victor Davis Hanson, The Dying Citizen, is a must read. And I've taken you longer than I said I was going to take. But I have to ask you one more question. Before we wake up, 
our enemies are not asleep. Neither the Islamic fanatics nor the kleptocrats in Turkey or Russia, but most especially not the Chinese Communist Party, not Xi, who has Mao-like ambitions. Do you think we wake up to that? I know, I know some of our national security elite is awake. Uh, is awake. Do you think we wake up to that threat in time? Well, I'm very worried because the United States has a long history going back to the Civil War and World War I and Pearl Harbor and even 9-11, where we feel that the more that we can outreach, the more than we talk, the, the more they will become like us or that the more that they will be impressed by our magnanimity or reciprocate it with kindness rather than disrespect or uh, contempt for naivete. And uh, what we happen in Afghanistan has already rippled into these overflights in Taiwan. They really do not believe that we have deterrence. And deterrence can be lost in a day, as you know you, but it takes decades uh, to reassert it and to recalibrate it. And I'm afraid now we may have to have an intervention so people believe us, and that would be very dangerous. But we're going to have to do something because there, are, whether it's Russia, or Iran, or North Korea, but particularly China, they feel that we either spiritually or psychologically are incapable of protecting our interests and our allies and ourselves. And there's historically, the greatest contempt goes to a powerful nation, materially, economically, militarily, that hesitates and allows other people to suffer because it can't use its power. And people like China think, if I had that power, I wouldn't do that. So they must be morally corrupt. And that's, that's the, what's the strong scary. horse. The yes. strong horse always outpaces the weak horse. Uh, ben, if you're still there and I have cut number one, I want to play it for Victor Hansen because it comes to January 6th. Uh, Vice President Pence was on yesterday talking about January 6th. He said something that, that you reference in your epilogue, and I want people to hear uh, what the vice president said yesterday. Can you play that? Look, you can't spend uh, almost five years in a political foxhole without somebody, without, without developing a strong relationship. And, uh, you know, January 6th was a tragic day uh, in the history of our Capitol uh, building. But uh, thanks to the efforts of uh, Capitol Hill police, federal officials, the Capitol was secured. We finished our work. Uh, and the president and I sat down a few days later and talked through all of it. I can tell you that we parted amicably at the end of the administration, and we've talked a number of times since we both left office. But, but I believe that our entire focus today should be on the future. I've campaigned a couple of times for Glenn Youngkin, who will be a great governor in the state of Virginia. I've been traveling all across this country, helping our team, running for the House and the Senate, and I'll be helping governor's candidates around America. So I know, the, I know the media wants to distract from the Biden administration's failed agenda by focusing on one day in January. They want to use that one day wow. to try and demean uh, the, the, the character and intentions of 74 million Americans who believed we could be strong again and prosperous again and supported our administration in 2016 and, and 2020. But for our part, I, I truly believe we all ought to remain completely focused on the future. That's where I'm focused, and I, I really well, I do want believe, a commission too. I believe, the I believe the important thing in that exchange, Victor Hansen, is something I've seen inside the Beltway: the attempt by the left to use January 6 as a cudgel on 74 million Americans. Now, uh, President Biden got 80 million Americans to vote for him. I believe there will be a swing the other way, so that. The next Republican nominee will get the 80 million and the Democrat will get 75 or less. But the attempt is to take the 800 or so who broke away from the earlier in the day rally that you discussed in The Dying Citizen, uh, another tenth of whom were actually violent and stormed the Capitol, to disparage the citizenship agenda generally, especially at the border. Do you believe that's happening the way the vice president and I believe it's happening? A absolutely, because this is a what they're if they're going to focus to distract you know whether it's afghanistan or illegal immigration and, and focus on january 6th then let's have an open discussion let's have the 14,000 hours of video let's ask why the person who shot a 14-year military vet veteran who was unarmed maybe it was justifiable let's have the whole testimonies out let's wonder why his name wasn't released when that was a protocol for every other officer who shoots an unarmed suspect Let's talk about why we use the word armed insurrection when not one gun was found with any of who arrested. Why haven't been pe why haven't people been charged with insurrection or conspiracy or some type of racketeering charge? Why did the FBI find after 
a laborious investigation. There was no conspiracy that they could find. And why did we lie in the tragic death of Officer Sicknick? Why did the left say that he was murdered by a Trump supporter? And that lie, uh, I, I think he should have been canonized. He was, he was a very great man. But the idea that he was killed violently by a Trump supporter was a lie. So when you add up those untruths, you ask yourself, why, if this event, ips, ipsis factis, was so terrible, why did they have to keep lying about it and, and adding to it and magnifying it? Because, and why, and one other thing, maybe we disagree on this, is that in June of 2020, we had all of these retired generals, and they said, General Milley did a photo op. Why Donald Trump used that to clear out Lafayette Square, used tear gas. They came out and said, don't ever, and considered using the military. But we know from the Inspector General of the Interior Department, he didn't give that order. None of them apologized. But more importantly, they sat quiet while we militarized Washington with 25,000 federal troops following this buffoonish riot of a few people who should be arrested, prosecuted, and guilty you know, convicted and punished for breaking into federal property. But none of our retired generals said, my God, we have militarized Washington in ways that Donald Trump couldn't even fathom. And so that uh, January 6th has been very dangerous because it's it's been so warped and politicized and massaged for these agendas that, uh, won't, that, that it just, it reminds us that nobody wants to talk about the truth. And why not just yeah, get the, the new facts? Rome. The new Rome has become centered on protecting the elites that run the new Rome. I, I believe that it, it was also it was buffoonish, but it was also dangerous to Mike Pence and a few other people. I never, ever want to come in second in condemning what the lawbreakers did on January 6th. I no, I and either. I heard you just say that. I just want to make people very, very clear. The event itself is being abused and it's being overstated and the peril of that day. The country's constitution was never in peril that day, the way it was on 9-11, the way that it will be if China decides to take us on, the way that it will be if the court is expanded. The basic constitution was never in peril. Order was going to be restored, even if violence was on the mind of some of the protesters and occupiers and insurrectionists. Victor, I am I'm somewhere between the dying citizen and optimism. Virginia will tell me a lot. But I hope that The Dying Citizen ends up on every bestsellers list in America, whether or not it's shadow banned from Amazon. Have you run into any of that yet, by the way? Uh, not yet, but I have had people, you know, in communications that, you know, sort of group emails or people like that. But remember you, it's not that I didn't entitle it The Dead Citizen. He's not dead yet. He's dying, yeah. but He's not dying. Dead. Uh, bad things can happen to people who are unaware of their peril. Victor Davis yeah. Hanson, always a pleasure to talk to you, Professor. Go out and get the dying citizen. That concludes today, the interview with Hugh Hewitt. Thank you for listening. Thank you.